Good morning. Can you tell me about the ticket options, please? Certainly. We've got various options, depending on whether you want to just visit parts of the exhibition or all of it. It's organised into various different sections, and because it's so large, you may not be interested in everything or have time for everything. You can buy tickets just for the sections you want to visit, and that makes it a lot cheaper. Well, um, I've really come here to see things to do with electronics. Right. Then I think you'll find the first part of the exhibition as you go in is quite relevant. It's all about electronics and how we can use them to protect the world around us. You know, the environment, and what we can do to avoid damaging it further. Protecting the environment. That sounds interesting. Anything I should specially look out for there? There are lots of new devices. One which fascinated me when I went round was a new instrument for measuring how the temperature of the ocean changes at different levels, and this can be done from a ship on the surface right down to the bottom. Great, I'll look out for that. Okay, and I see you've got your son with you, which is nice because. The subject of the next section is all about different things for keeping an eye on your children and looking after their safety. It contains a range of things, from electronic instruments used in medicine to children's electronic games, and even a number of new devices to prevent children from having an accident when they're at home. That sounds useful. Yes, there's even an invention for older children. You'll see a demonstration of it while you're there. Which helps parents to make sure their kids are going to school. Really useful in families where both parents work. It sort of electronically tells parents about their kids' attendance, and sends them a signal via the internet. Very convenient, but my son is a bit young to worry about that yet. Are there any other sections which feature electronics? Sure, there's another section. It's the third you come to, I think, which should interest everyone. It contains lots of new electronic instruments or devices for looking after and working with money. You know,、uh, like that thing you must have heard of, which counts what you're putting into your supermarket trolley and adds up the bill as you go around. Right, money. That sounds interesting too. Well, thanks for the information. I'd like tickets for myself and my son for those three sections, then, please. Okay, so let's have a closer look at the section on the process of desalination. Well, I just need to outline the principle of the process, don't I? Uh huh. Yes. Yes, you need to explain first what desalination means. Well, I want to start by referring to a natural form of desalination,、um, and to say that a seabird filters salt out of seawater in its throat. Okay, that's interesting.、Mm. So they just spit the salt out, do they? Yes. Right, that's a good introduction. Then you can go on to describe the mechanical process. Yes. Well, the first stage is the collection.、Um, it involves a large plant that collects the water. Actually, it goes through a canal, and that passes the water into the plant, which treats it. You know, removes all the rubbish. Yes. So the treatment's the second stage. What happens next? Well, the next stage is that it goes through a lot of pipes until it reaches the point where the salt is removed. Okay, so that's the next point on your chart. Yes, I can talk about this quite a lot. The salts separated from fresh water. Right, the water passes through a membrane.、Mm, not exactly. That's the whole thing. The sea water has to be forced,、uh, pumped. And a lot of pressure is involved.、Mm. You need to make that point. Explain that the water doesn't go freely. No, because the salt is heavy. This is the really expensive part of the process. Okay. So after that, what happens? 
Well, there's some more treatment after the high-pressure filtering process, but eventually the system produces fresh water. OK. It might be good to mention what's left over. Salt. And that's a really big problem. Where does it go? After the desalination process, the substance that remains, it's called brine, it's a very salty substance and it goes back, usually into the sea. Mm. It's not good for fish, though. It damages marine life. Well, you can discuss that in the next section of your presentation. Yeah. Um, so, anyway, a lot of the fresh water that's produced is used for human consumption. Uh-huh, yes, and... Uh, it's also used for irrigation, for watering farmland. Great. Well, you've mentioned some of the disadvantages there. Now listen carefully and answer questions 5 to 8. Hi Sarah, come on in. You said you wanted to discuss the research project you're working on. You know, the one on children's outdoor play. Ah uh, yes, it's going well. I've put together a plan and have set myself some research goals. Great, what are they? Well, I mostly want to find out what the benefits of outdoor play are. Then, I'd like to examine why it has decreased in recent years. That sounds good. Do you have evidence for the claim that children's play has decreased? I do. I have government statistics showing that playgrounds are used 25% less often than they were a decade ago. OK, it sounds like you have some good research there. Thanks. But the issue I'm having is how to find research on why children's outdoor play has decreased. There isn't much out there. What do you suggest? Well, the best thing to do is to conduct a survey of your own. You can ask parents with children at local schools to answer it. I can put you in touch with a few head teachers who could help. Great. I'll start thinking about some questions. Yes, that will be the first step. Try and test out a few hypotheses through your survey. So, have you got any ideas for why outdoor play is decreasing? I have. I think that the increasing amount of media aimed at children, including television, apps, online games and so on, has something to do with it. And then, other things, like children being expected to devote more time to intense academic work after school could be factors. Also, there may be fewer playgrounds or green spaces for children to use. Those all sound like plausible reasons. I think parents may also have an effect on this issue. That could be. Perhaps parents are less willing to let children play alone outside than they once were. Yes, that may be true. OK. So for the first step, I think I should start writing the survey. Yes, you can go ahead and begin that. When you're done, send it to me and I'll give you some feedback. And after that, we can get in touch with some teachers that may be able to circulate it. The teachers will be interested in seeing... Listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Welcome to this talk on soil science and organic farming. Dirt, soil, earth, loam, mud or dust, it doesn't matter what you call it, is of primary importance in the production of food and other crops. Most people think of it just as a substrate or medium in which plants grow, but it's more than that. It's actually a living entity or it should be if it's healthy, and human health is affected by the health of the soil. Healthy, living soil is literally crawling with life. There are the obvious earthworms, which burrow in the soil and help to aerate and improve it, beetles and other hard-backed insects, and various invertebrates like centipedes. Then there are fungi and bacteria, also living forms. Healthy soil needs food, air and water to help plants grow and the more nutrients in plants, the more available for humans and livestock. It stands to reason, therefore, that plants grown in poor soil 
will have few nutrients to pass on to the consumer, whose well-being will be worse off over the long term. So, where do plants get their nourishment? Most of it comes from the soil. Some nutrients are made up of minerals from the earth, while others come from dead plant and animal matter, which is broken down over time by the living insects and other organisms in the soil. Plants depend on these little living creatures to convert minerals and other vital elements into a utilizable form that can be taken up by the plants. And it's a synergistic relationship. In turn, the plants assist those helpful organisms by releasing sugars and enzymes back into the soil. You will hear part of a lecture about people living near active volcanoes. All right, now, since we are talking this week about volcanoes, I thought it might be interesting to step away a bit from the geological analysis and look at what it would be like to live near an active volcano. It seems quite strange that someone would choose to live near something that could erupt at any time, right? Well, there are actually some advantages to building a home near a volcano, and these advantages reveal a lot about how volcanoes impact the local environment. One benefit of living near a volcano is that you have access to unlimited geothermal energy. Geothermal energy, as you may know, is energy that is generated and stored in the Earth. Heat that naturally occurs in the Earth's crust can be converted into energy that can be used for electricity. This energy is harnessed by utilizing the underground steam that has been heated by the Earth's magma. This steam drives turbines in geothermal power stations to produce electricity. It's a clean and sustainable form of energy, so countries with a lot of volcanoes take advantage of this. Look at, for example, Iceland. About 66% of its energy comes from these steam-powered turbines. In fact, only 0.1% of all energy in the nation comes from fossil fuels. So not only can we harness energy from volcanoes, but there's also some of the most fertile soil in the world around volcanoes. You see, when a volcano erupts, it throws out ash. At first, that ash can do some damage to nearby flora, fauna, and humans as well. But in the long term, the ash layer that accumulates on the Earth's surface is converted into a very rich soil because the ash is loaded with minerals. So people who live off the land near volcanoes have abundant agricultural production, prompting them to return even after serious eruptions. And lastly, volcanoes help to create lots of tourism. Think about Hawaii. What is on the top of the list of attractions to do while on the islands? That's right, visiting a volcano. And there are often other natural wonders around that are created by volcanoes. Hot springs, geysers, and interesting rock formations, just to name a few. These tourists need places to stay and eat, and tour guides to show them around. And have I mentioned that tourists love to shop? So living near a volcano practically guarantees that you'll be able to find employment. That's why there are generally large populations living in close. You will hear a student giving a presentation on composting. Hello, everyone. The topic that I chose to present on today is the composting of organic trash materials. Now, many of us probably place our food waste in bins, so it can be picked up and brought to a waste management facility. In a survey that was conducted in my neighbourhood, over ninety percent of residents do this, but only about twenty percent of them. Know what happens to the waste at the facility. So, what I'll show you all today is a prototype miniaturized version of the machines used to compost organic materials at waste management facilities. Now, here it is, and I can assure you that it's delightfully simple to use. The top of the device acts very similarly to a recycling bin. The food waste is placed in this bin before it is processed. Once this lever on the side is pulled, the materials being processed 
then proceed into another chamber shaped like a drum, which rotates for about twenty minutes for each cycle. This chamber churns the waste, breaking the organic materials down into a consistent size and shape. After that, the organic materials that have been broken up are kept in the drum for six weeks. During this time, the materials are exposed to oxygen, which reacts with organic components such as carbon, protein, nitrogen, and water molecules, as well as microorganisms. This is actually a chemical reaction taking place, which produces two byproducts: carbon dioxide and heat. When six weeks have passed, the finished compost is complete. By lifting this lid on the side here, biodegradable matter is expelled. This, in turn, can be safely added to the soil. This is convenient for home use, since the spillage can immediately be spread onto your lawn or garden, or stored in a separate bin for later use. So, as you can see, this composting machine is small and simple enough for everyday use, and I hope this is what it is used for in the near future. So now I'll take any questions that you have for me. You now have fifteen seconds to check your answers. Hi there. Can I help you? Yes, I'd like to find out more information about the services here at the Students' Union. Of course, we're here to help you throughout your time at university. <laughs> So, what kind of help can you give me exactly? Well, our job focuses on three main areas: giving advice and information to students, arranging social events, and campaigning for students' rights. Right. And what about help with things relating to everyday life? Well, we have a team of six advisers who work part time and have expertise in certain areas, including accommodation and travel. Oh, that's great! And how can I contact the advisers? Right, there are several ways. You can come into this office and speak to an advisor in person, or email us if you can't come in. And there's also a twenty-four hour helpline. You can find the helpline number on your student card. And you can call us at any time of day or night with any questions or worries you have. Okay, and thanks for your help. You're welcome. If you're working on a project with other students and you want to discuss things with each other, you can go to the room in the corner at the opposite end of the library from the copiers. That's the group study room. It's between the sociology section and the TV room. The group study room must be booked forty-eight hours in advance. Right. Thanks.、Uh, can I keep this map? Actually, this is the last one I have, but I can make a copy for you. That would be great. Thanks. Oh, I should also explain how you book the group study room. Oh yes. So how do I do that? You can only book this room using the online reservation system, the same one you use to reserve books that are currently on loan. I thought it was called the online catalogue system. No, that's for searching for things in the library. The reservation system is what you use to make a room booking. And can I access that from outside the library? Yes, via the library website. You will need to enter the name and student number of each student in the group too. So make sure you have these to hand when you make the booking. But all this is explained on the home page of the website. Once you've made your reservation request, you'll receive a confirmation email from the library to say whether your booking has been successful or not. If not, you can try to arrange another time. Well, that sounds fairly easy. Yes, you'll be fine. It's all quite straightforward, really. Thanks.